Hello and welcome to Rajya Sabha Television. You're watching a brand new edition of World Panorama with me, Frank Pereira. Over the next half an hour, we'll bring you a roundup of all the significant events that have happened around the world this week. But first, a look at the headlines. Hamas dissolves Gaza administration in Palestinian unity bid. Palestinian President Mahmoud Abbas and Hamas leader Ismail Haniye speak for the first time in months. Gazans unconcerned about reconciliation want sanctions lifted. Myanmar State Council Aung San Suu Kyi delivers State of the Union address defends her government's handling of the Rakhine crisis, says that Myanmar is ready to take back Rohingya Muslims who have fled. In his first address to the United Nations, US President Donald Trump issues a strong warning to North Korea, calling Kim Jong-un rocket man on a suicide mission. World leaders also discuss other issues including the political crisis in the Gulf, the Iran nuclear deal and situation between Israel and Palestine. And over 250 people killed in a massive 7.1 magnitude earthquake in Mexico. After the second earthquake in two weeks, government declares emergency in the affected areas. At least 3,000 buildings found damaged in Mexico City. Our top focus uh, on World Panorama this week. Hamas called on Palestinian President Mahmoud Abbas on Tuesday to respond to the disbanding of its shadow government in the Gaza Strip by ending his sanctions on the impoverished enclave. Following Egyptian-mediated reconciliation talks with Abbas's Western-backed Fatah faction, Islamist Hamas said last Sunday it would dissolve its Gaza administrative committee to enable the president's administration to retake control. Here's a detailed report. Palestinian Islamist Hamas group said last Sunday that it has dissolved its administration that runs Gaza and agreed to hold a general election in order to end a long-running feud with President Mahmoud Abbas's Fatah movement. Now Hamas took a courageous, serious and patriotic decision to dissolve the administrative committee in Gaza. But how would Fatah movement and the president of Palestinian Authority deal with this decision or with the Egyptian effort? We believe that Mahmoud Abbas and Fatah have a new test of dealing with the Egyptian effort and of dealing with achieving the aspirations of our Palestinian people. The last Palestinian legislative election was held in 2006 when Hamas scored a surprise victory which led for a political rupture. Hamas and Fatah sought a short civil war in Gaza in 2007 and since then Hamas has governed the small coast enclave. We welcome this agreement too because we do not want to give a chance to any Arab or any international site to point at us that we are the obstacle for the acceptance of the Palestinian people and its decisions on all aspects because of their division or because we are the reason. We hope that we became like a school that the world can learn from. Numerous attempts since 2011 to reconcile the two movements and form a power-sharing unity government in Gaza and the West Bank have so far failed. Hamas and Fatah agreed in 2014 to form a national reconciliation government, but despite that agreement, Hamas's shadow government has continued to rule the Gaza Strip. Hoping to pressure Hamas to relinquish control of Gaza, Abbas has cut payment to Israel for the electricity it supplies to Gaza. This means that electricity has often been provided for less than four hours a day and never more than six. The street not concerned about Palestinian reconciliation. People's concern is one thing. Why did the water stop? And why did the electricity cut? People are frustrated. The reconciliation does not matter to me as a Palestinian because honestly, after suffering from the siege for the 10 years and more, I started hoping that Fatah or Hamas never came back. We hope that they became united to have an opinion because the enemy is one enemy, the land is one, the president should be one and to have one minister because life cannot exist with two heads in one body. Thank you.
On Tuesday, Hamas called on Mahmoud Abbas to respond to the disbanding of its shadow government in the Gaza Strip by ending his sanctions on the impoverished enclave. We are ready, starting now, to welcome the government of national consensus to enter Gaza and are ready in days to return to Cairo to resume the dialogue between Fatah and Hamas and reach Palestinian national comprehensive dialogue. The Western-backed 82-year-old Abbas is now 12 years into what was to be a four-year term and is an unpopular leader, according to opinion polls. He has no clear successor and there are no steps being taken towards a presidential election anytime soon. Bureau Report, Rajya Sabhati. Well, join me for a chat this week to talk about this is Reza Ul Hassan, Associate Editor of the Hindustan Times. Thank you so much for joining me on the program. You know, what circumstances have led to this moment where Hamas has decided to extend the olive branch to Fatah? Well, I think uh, the biggest uh, development here is that Hamas is trying to force Mahmoud Abbas's hands. I mean, this is something, you know, it's another, possibly another uh, tactic to try and, you know, draw him out. But if you really look back at the package that we just saw, uh, the first person on the road who spoke, I mean, that I think kind of sums up everything about this whole uh, problem here, the, the, the amount of frustration and the amount of fatigue that is there. I mean, if you really look at it, I mean, I was in this area last year, and if you look at the Gaza Strip, it's just a small piece of land, but probably the greatest amount of suffering and, you know, kind of deprivation packed into per square inch. I mean, it's the kind of conditions I have Palestinian friends and the way they describe the problems they face, either to go in or to come out of G the Gaza Strip. So, I mean, it's, it's an offer that's been made now, but we really have to wait and see whether this is going to work out because the Hamas and Fatah did try to work things out in 2014, just three years, and it yeah. didn't work. Yeah, you know, there are several skeptics, media reports as well, that suggest that re this reconciliation might not even happen. So w would you also suspect the same? Well, there are, you know, I, 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 I wouldn't say that, you know, I would like it to work out, but there are a lot of factors that would, you know, go against it. Uh, Mahmoud Abbas, for example, does not trust the people who have been involved in the negotiations. Uh, there's a gentleman called Mohammed Dahlan who's played a key role in negotiations behind the scenes. And Abbas does not trust him. So he, he himself has this distrust of uh, the Hamas. On the other side, the Fatah really hasn't, uh, you know, sort of, uh, you know, groomed a second rung of leadership. It's still very old people. I mean, Mahmoud Abbas, as you pointed out, is 82 years yeah. old. So he's virtually on his last legs. On the other hand, you have another very key player, Israel. Israel may be more willing to, uh, you know, deal with uh, Mahmoud Abbas, but they're definitely not going to work with Hamas. You know, well, well, it's interesting that you brought up the Israelis. Will the Israelis breathe a sigh of relief now with seeing the developments over the last 10 days? I don't think so. I don't think so. I, I, you know, especially when you have a government led by Benjamin Netanyahu, who he's, he's made it very, very clear that, you know, the Hamas is something that they don't want to work with. Uh, possibly, as I said, they may be more willing to work with Fatah. I mean, they'll be watching this very closely, but I don't think the Israelis are going to, you know, be thinking that this is going to be successful. Um, there is also another point that we, you know, I mean, I just, I'd like to bring up here. When we were in this region last year, there was a lot of concern about how a lot of the youth in, in the Gaza Strip are becoming very, very frustrated with the lack of development, the, the poverty, the deprivation. And there were very strong fears that groups such as the Islamic State, which are not very far away, they're in the Sinai, they could be fishing in the troubled waters of Gaza Strip. You know, talking about the Gazans, you know, you spoke about their plight earlier as well, and you brought that up now too. What, what options do they really have? Well, it's sad, but, you know, again, going back to that package, we saw the gentleman, the old gentleman who spoke. I mean, he kind of summed up all their options. There are no options. This is a, this is a bunch of people who are living in this small strip of land, virtually no electricity, no, f you know, they, the food supplies are erratic. They're not allowed to travel. I mean, I had a Palestinian friend who was telling me that, you know, they have this, they have to make this long journey via the Sinai if they want to get out, you know. And it's just, if you, if that wall wasn't there and if the blockade of the Gaza Strip wasn't there, you could just, just get out and fly out of Tel Aviv. But now they have to take this whole circuitous route. So, I mean, it's, it's going to be, it's not going to be easy. It's not going to be easy and it looks like it's going to continue for, for a long time, isn't it? It's not going to, it's, it's not, a, there's, there's no solution inside, at least for the time being. Well, I mean, I'm hopeful. This is, this is a nice, interesting development. If the Hamas is really serious, if, if it means business, great. 
but you know, I, I, I don't think it's going to be very easy. It's going okay. to take some time. Sure. So it's going to be a long, arduous road ahead. Yeah. Rezaul Hassan, thank you so much for joining me on the program and putting things into perspective for us. Moving on now, of course, amid growing international condemnation, Myanmar State Councillor Aung San Suu Kyi made her first comments on the Rohingya crisis on Tuesday. She said the violence in the Rakhine state has ended and the country was ready to take back refugees subject to a verification process. She also reached out to the global community for support on the refugee crisis, urging them to help her nation unite across religious and ethnic lines. In a State of the Union address on Tuesday, Myanmar State Councillor Aung San Suu Kyi defended her government over the mass exodus of Rohingya Muslims. She claimed that violence has ended in Rakhine City and that Muslims living in the area continue to stay there. While expressing sorrow for people displaced by the violence, Suu Kyi said Myanmar was committed to a sustainable solution. We feel deeply for the suffering of all the people who have been caught up, caught up in the conflict. Those who have had to flee their homes are many, not just Muslims and Rakhines, but also small minority groups, such as the Daina, Maro, Tep, Maramaji, and Hindus, of whose presence most of the world is totally unaware. Since the 5th of September, there have been no armed clashes and there have been no clearance operations. Suu Kyi also condemned the human rights violations and the violence. She, however, maintained that the government does not fear international scrutiny of its handling of the Rohingya crisis. We condemn all human rights violations and unlawful violence. We are committed to the restoration of peace, stability and rule of law throughout the state. As a responsible member of the community of nations, Myanmar does not fear international scrutiny and are committed to a sustainable solution that would lead to peace, stability and development for all communities within that state. Suu Kyi received overwhelming support where hundreds of people gathered outside the city hall in Yangon expressing support to her. Mother Aung San Suu Kyi gave a speech today so that the whole world can know what is actually happening inside our country. We come here to show our support to her, no matter if we understand or not understand her speech in English language. We are ordinary citizens. We just want peace. Majority citizens are Buddhists in our country. There are no discrimination in the region or races. People can come and see our country. India also welcomes Suu Kyi's pledge to restore peace in the Rakhine state and take back its people. I think what we heard in the remarks of the state councillor today was encouraging from that perspective. She has spoken about a process by which Myanmar will be ready to take back the uh, refugees who have gone across the border and uh, then further steps will be taken in accordance with the laws here in terms of the national verification etc and the other uh, processes and other issues that are there uh, in the in the state which are of much longer standing and which Myanmar needs to resolve in the context of its larger process of, uh, of uh, building peace and national reconciliation. International groups, though, criticize Suu Kyi's speech for failing to address the allegations of abuse by the military. Amnesty International said the Nobel laureate and her government were burying their heads in sand. UN investigators also said they needed unfettered access to Myanmar to investigate the crisis. Bureau Report, Rajasabha TV. Well, it's time for a short break now, but still to come, a deadly 7.1 magnitude quake in Mexico leaves over 200 people, 250 people dead. Horror tales emerge as authorities pull out people stuck under the debris of collapsed buildings. That and much more on the other side. Stay tuned. We'll be right back. The story we thought we knew. The story of magnificence. The story of bloody battles. Of those who ruled. 
and those who left their footprints. The story charting the course of our past. Talking history on Rajya Sabha TV. Welcome back. You're watching World Panorama with me, Frank Pereira. Well, as world leaders gathered for the 72nd session of the UN General Assembly in New York, several important issues have come into the spotlight. U.S. President Donald Trump's threats to decimate North Korea for its nuclear program has brought the Iran nuclear deal back into focus. Other issues, including the political crisis in the Gulf region and situation between Israel and Palestine, were also discussed. French President Emmanuel Macron hit out at US President Donald Trump staunchly defending the Iran nuclear deal, saying that those who did not respect it were irresponsible. He said that renouncing the nuclear deal would be a grave error. Macron also said that he had conveyed this to Trump and Iranian President Hassan Rouhani when he met them on Monday. Renouncing it would be a grave error. It would be responsible for all of us to fail to uphold that agreement because this is a good agreement, an agreement that's essential to peace at a time when a downward spiral cannot be discounted. This is what I said yesterday to my US and Iranian partners. I wish for us to work on constraining the ballistic activity of Iran. We must work on the post-2020 solution. We must increase our demands, but we must not cast aside the achievements that we have made with previous agreements. Thanks to dialogue, we have managed to resolve the Iranian situation. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, however, said that the nuclear deal should either be changed to eliminate provisions that remove restrictions on Tehran's atomic program over time, or it should be cancelled. Fixing the deal requires many things, among them inspecting military and any other site that is a suspect, and penalizing Iran for every violation. But above all, fixing the deal means getting rid of the sunset clause. And beyond fixing this bad deal, we must also stop Iran's development of ballistic missiles and roll back its growing aggression in the region. The recent political crisis in the Gulf region also came up for discussion. Qatar's Emir Sheikh Tamim bin Hamad Al Thani renewed a call for unconditional dialogue to end the crisis that has pitted his country against four Arab states. The countries who imposed the unjust blockade on Qatar have intervened in the internal affairs of state by bringing pressure to bear the citizens for foodstuff, medicine, cutting family ties to force them to change their political affiliation, thus destabilizing a sovereign country. Isn't this one of the definitions of terrorism? Among the other issues that were discussed was the Israel-Palestine issue. Egyptian President Abdel Fattah al-Sisi urged Palestinians to overcome their differences and be ready to coexist with each other and with Israelis. Bureau Report, Rajya Sabha TV. Well, a strong 7.1 magnitude earthquake struck central Mexico on Tuesday night, killing at least 295 people. At least 3,000 buildings have been found damaged in Mexico City as the search narrows for the earthquake's last possible survivors. Heavy rains have only complicated matters. This is the second major earthquake to hit the country in two weeks. and confusion returned to the streets of Mexico as yet another strong earthquake hit the central part of the country and caused massive devastation in the three towns of Mexico, Morelos and Puebla. 
Rescue crews and ordinary citizens work through Tuesday night and Wednesday morning searching through rubble for survivors as the death toll climbed over 200. Mexico City Mayor Miguel Angel Mancera confirmed that buildings at 44 locations had collapsed or were badly damaged. These are set to include a six-story blocks of flats, a supermarket and a factory. President Enrique Piena Nieto addressed the nation late in the night, assuring all help to the victims. He also said that an emergency had been declared for the affected areas and the military was being drafted in to help with the response. La prioridad our priority is to continue with the rescue of those who are under the rubble and give medical attention to those injured. Emergency services from Social Security, Pemex, that Army and the Marines are available to everyone. In Mexico City, thousands of soldiers, rescuers and civilians, including college students, were working side by side to dig through tall piles of rubble from dozens of crumbled buildings. Power poles toppled in the quake have blocked streets and public transportation system was temporarily shut down. As many as 4.6 million homes, businesses and other facilities had lost electricity, including 40% of homes in Mexico City. We never know what can happen if there will be an aftershock, so it is best for us to leave and return in few days. What I like is the fact that people is helping each other. Mm -hmm. I mean, in a, in, a, in a situation like this, you gotta help each other. There is, there is no other choice. I was working this morning, I was evacuated from the building, mm -hmm. and, uh, and I was walking by. So I saw that the, the help was needed, that's why I came over. Mexico is prone to earthquakes, and earlier this month, an 8.1 magnitude tremor in the south left at least 90 dead. Ironically, Tuesday's tremor struck shortly after many people had taken part in an earthquake drill exactly 32 years after a quake killed thousands in Mexico City. Bureau Report, Raj Sabha TV. Well, let's now shift gears and bring you up to speed with all the sports news you might have missed this week in sports action. Antonio Sanabria scored a 94th minute winner as Real Betis shocked Real Madrid to win at the Santiago Bernabeu in La Liga for the first time in 19 years. The 21-year-old dived into Antonio Barragan's cross to head past Real Madrid goalkeeper Kila Navas. Zinedine Zidane's side dominated for large spells but Cristiano Ronaldo was among the home players to waste chances as Real produced 27 efforts on goal. It leaves the European champion seven points adrift of leaders Barcelona. Chelsea have agreed terms with Atletico Madrid for the transfer of striker Diego Costa back to the Spanish club. The move, which will be completed in January, is subject to the agreement of personal terms and a medical. Atletico said the 28-year-old who left the club to join Chelsea in 2014 would have a medical in the next few days. Spain international Costa has not played for the Blues this season and spent much of August in his native Brazil. He cannot be registered as a player for the La Liga outfit until January when the club's transfer window ban comes to an end. The World Archery Championships are set to go ahead in Mexico City next month despite the earthquake which killed over 250 people earlier this week. World Archery said that it will monitor the situation with a tournament scheduled to start on the 15th of October. Secretary General Tom D. Ellen said that he hoped the event would be a positive spectacle of sport and solidarity for the people of Mexico City. The International Paralympic Committee postponed its World Championships in powerlifting and swimming following the disaster. Britain's Chris Froome added a World Championship bronze medal in the time trial to this year's historic Tour de France and Vuelta España double. 32-year-old Froome finished in third, 1 minute 21 seconds behind the winner, Tom Dumoulin of the Netherlands. Dumoulin crossed the line in 44 minutes and 41 seconds, with Primoz Roglic taking silver over the 31-kilometer course. Earlier this month, Froome became the third man to complete the Tour de France Vuelta double in the same year. Unified light heavyweight world champion Andre Ward has retired ending a career which delivered world titles across two weight divisions. 33-year-old Ward held titles at super middleweight but moved up to a weight division and unified the WBA, IBF and WBO light heavyweight belts in 2016. 
In a statement, he said his body could not put up with the rigors of boxing. He last fought in June when he stopped Sergei Kovalov in a Las Vegas rematch to defend the titles he had won in a unification bout with the Russians seven months earlier. And finally, innovation of programs and integration of local culture elements enchanted the audience at the 10th China Acrobatics Contest, which represents best acrobatic skills in the country. The contest ended on Monday in Penglai City, East China, Shandong Province. 28 acrobatic troops from across the country competed for the title. Many of them were medal winners at international competitions. I'm going to leave you with these visuals from China. Until next time, this is Frank Pereira signing off.